Yep, and run. We're up and running. We are recording, and it's live from St. Mark Lutheran Church, Robert Yule. Okay. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Let's just ask the Lord to be here with us. Jesus, we want to study your word and hear what you have to say to us. And so um, just be with us, have your spirit be in our hearts and open our minds to your words and your thoughts. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you have Bibles, um, we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, I believe there's Bibles somewhere around here. Oh, they're behind it in that box there. We have more Bibles. You want more Bibles? Here. And first Samuel is towards the beginning, right after Judges. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. I think we're good. All right. I got a cheat sheet. I've heard, you know, in apologetics, you know, that uh, atheists believe that everything is time, matter, and chance. It's a great question to ask somebody who doesn't, who doesn't believe that everything is time, matter, and chance. What's your answer to morality? Yeah, you, you would have, you would have really had a lot of fun. Maybe we'll we'll do some more of these as this class goes on about uh, hard tough questions. Mm -hmm. That's the classic. Um, Christians have difficulty answering the question of evil. Why did God allow evil? It's a little mm -hmm. challenging for us to address. Mm -hmm. For the non-Christian, especially for the atheist non-Christian, for them the unanswerable question is: is why do you believe in good? Mm -hmm. There is no naturalistic. Morality. Reason to believe in good. And so that's a problem that they face. You're, you're, you are my ace. Student. All right. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at the text. Um, 1 Samuel 8 is where we're going to start. And um, just kind of a little a preamble on this. Um, Samuel was the last judge. He was considered to be not only a judge, but also a prophet. And he was a very, very uh, um, good judge. Everyone knew that Samuel was very honest, trustworthy, faithful, and all of those sort of things. However, as many of us struggle with, his children were not as good as him. And so in uh, verse five, I'm going to pick up there. The elders come to him and say, look, you're old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge over us like all the nations. Okay. And it was interesting. The, if you go back to verse three, what were, what were the sons doing wrong? They didn't walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Right. And these were the priests. They were priests. No, no. Right? These were his sons. This is Samuel's sons. So but weren't they also priests? I'm sorry. I you're thinking of Eli, the um, yeah, chief Eli priest. Is Samuel is um, not technically the chief priest. He's oh, just I'm the sorry. judge. Of course. Okay. Um, and so they acted as judges. And, you know, these judges are corrupt. But wait a minute. What does it take? It takes two to dance, two to tango. What's the problem with the people's heart? They're bribing the judges. And so it, it not only is there a problem with the sons of Samuel, but the people wanted judges they could bribe. So that's kind of an interesting backdrop to this um, passage that we're about to get to. Um, so let's go ahead, if I can get someone to read verses six through nine. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected as their king, but me. As they have done from the day I brought them out, out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them. 
but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Okay. So this is the verse. Well, let me just ask that as a question. What was God's diagnosis of the people of Israel? What did God think of the people and the request for a king? They were just thinking here, serving other gods. Right. So, he, so who are they rejecting? Samuel. Samuel's sons? Samuel? Yeah, I mean, I rejecting God. God. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is where this word came. Yeah. The What's ungodliness. That? Okay. So the people reject God. They are ungodly. They do not want to be godly. They don't want to follow the Lord. This is the heart condition that God diagnosed of the people of Israel. So now you can kind of see where I got this statement mm -hmm. from. That was very shocking to me um, when I suddenly realized that, wait a minute, um, that's, that's, the, that's the problem. What's the solution that God gives them? What does he tell Samuel to give them as a result of that? Okay. Right, give them what they want. Mm -hmm. Give them a king. Okay. I think the other part of that too is Saul. Picking Saul was with the, what the people wanted somebody like Saul to be the first king. I think he uh, looked at the uh, it, the people picked Saul, not him per se, uh, because that's what the people wanted somebody that was Saul's statue mm -hmm. at that's, that time. That's right. You actually just started to answer the next question I have. <laughs> Um, which is fine. It's a great smart class. What is it that the people want their king to do? Solve their problems. problems. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that what we want? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're typical. I don't think there's any change since Adam and Eve and who people are, and what they want, what they do. Okay, we'll solve our problems. It, it actually explicitly says if they wanted him to be a judge, I think the implication being a fair and honest judge like King's like yeah. Samuel was. Okay. Um, is there anything else that they want their king to do? It may not be in this text, you'll find it elsewhere. They want him to rule over them like others. So that I mean one of the reasons that was the word I was looking for, yeah. Other kings. So what are the characteristics of other kings? Finish your thought. Well, I mean, Burl's comment is partly the deal with Saul was he was the tallest man in the empire right i mean he was enormous he was charismatic he was handsome he was beautiful great soldier led the army but he was foolish and he didn't know god really i mean he didn't want the job either but that's a strategic issue okay but again you're talking about the man saul but what were they looking for they wanted a king they wanted to be like other nations they wanted to go raiding and take booty they wanted to have strong borders they wanted to be wealthy you know um they wanted prosperity. They wanted to be um, free from the dangers of being attacked by other people. That sort of thing. So that's what people a, want from their king. In a sense, that's exactly what we want too. But uh, who do you depend on? That's the whole question. Uh, with Samuel, Samuel uh, depended on the Lord, but the people through the ages have a lot of the, uh, desires of their own. And they will give up the Lord for those desires. Okay. So that's what we want. Got that in mind? Those are the things that we want. But there was something that uh, is alluded to here. And um, God tells them, go tell them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So they know what they want. But God says, I know what you want. This is what you're going to get. And that's what we're going to look at next. So starting at verse 10, it's a little bit a long passage if I've got someone who likes to read. Um, I'd like you to read all the way through verse 17. 10 through 17. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve him with his chariots and horses and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, but still others make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. 
He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your field and vineyards and olives and groves and give them to his tenants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to the officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out nope, for relief from the tree. You're done. You have you're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. <laughs> okay, that was a long list. Let's long see list. if you can uh, distract that. We're First Samuel 8, we're looking to see if that top statement is true. Government is God's prescription for ungodliness. So far in First Samuel 8, we have seen that God said, your desire for a king is a rejection of me which is where the word ungodliness comes from. So the people of Israel are ungodly and they want a king. It's a rejection of God and his ways. We just very kindly had read to us, um, we talked about what God wants, the people want their king to be. And we just had a long list of what God says the king will do. So what are some of the things that a king will do? He'll take your sons, make them serve in his army. You know, women are going to really have to work hard. <laughs> Cooking, baking, and making perfume. <laughs> you're well, those are luxury goods. You're, you're going to be slaves. Ooh, who said that? Joni. Joni. No, 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 the guy who wrote for Samuel. <laughs> Samuel does. <laughs> Yeah, and that's interesting. Most of your translations, the word there, it's in verse, the last verse I had to read, it says, he will make you your servants. The actual Hebrew word there is slave. It is not servant. Difference. Yeah. So um, that word is actually slave. You have to have like an amplified or a, a lexicon before you find that out. NIV's got it as slave. No, that's a good for NIV. I don't normally read NIV. Mm -hmm. Well, he was uh, telling them just what the other kings were doing uh, with those other groups of people, uh, one thing after another, uh, which proved very... Okay, there's some more things in there, but go to the text. What does the text say the king is going to do? Well, they'll run in front of his chariots. I mean... Yeah. King's sons, this is to make soldiers out of them. Yes, it's my interpretation. And Take all their food. Best of their food. Them, yeah. They'll take oh, the ground and turn them into serfs, basically. Reap the harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. There's nothing about TDs or iPads in that. He's going to take your servants. going to take your animals. He'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his flunkies. Yep. My word. Cronies, whatever. <laughs> He'll take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage, and he'll give it to his flunkies, officials, and attendants. He'll take your servants, men and women, and the best of your cattle, the donkeys he'll just take for his own use. He'll take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. Right. That's about that. And by the way, it's interesting to note that this is the concluding remark as slaves. Even the flunkies become their slaves. Everyone becomes beholden to the king. I'll just give you a context so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. The worst possible place to be in a communist country is to be one of the flunkies. You have to attend all the party meetings. You have to do all the things they require you to. It is a emotionally and spiritually deadening experience to be a party member in a communist country. And um, it's just something to kind of think about because you all become slaves. He enslaves everybody. How many think that this was a good deal? Okay, pretty it's bad. It's a good deal for the king. The one king. Yeah, the king. He's a happy guy. All right. So that's what happens. And Joni started to read verse, um, the next verse there. But this is, again, one of the key verses because this is a stunning verse. Um, someone please read me verse 18. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. It sounds so much like today. 
Yeah, well, I, don't think uh, that we're any different I want you to stop thinking about that. So when we complain about our government. What is God's response? You chose it. You asked for it. Yeah. It's it, uh, other translation says you said will not respond. It says he will not hear you. It's yeah. like talk to the hand. This is a parent talking to small children. I don't hear you. <laughs> I'm not listening. La 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 la. Um, that's an amazing verse. I mean, normally we read verses in scripture where God says, you know, return to me. I want to help you. I love you. This is one God going, I'm not listening. I'm not going to listen to your complaints. And that's where the word prescription came from on that statement. It is God's prescription. Take your medicine is what God is saying to us. That's where I came up with that word prescription as I, meditated on the thought he's not what god won't listen to me when i complain about my government how's it ever going to get better so when we complain about government god will not listen to us i will do an aside here that's not in the text but it's throughout scripture it's matter of fact the prophets are full of this comment what is the correct response to government pay your taxes according to the bible you're supposed to listen to your government if Caesar was You're, Caesar's. Okay. Emotional response. Am I supposed to complain? What is it that God is trying to deal with here? Listen to me. Right. He's trying to deal with that. What's the correct response when I realize I've been ungodly? Repent. Thank you. <laughs> that is the correct answer. And this is what you see throughout the, um, the prophets in particular. Repent. Return to God. Give up your evil ways. Quit trying to do this your way. Listen to God's word. Be obedient to God's word. Stop being ungodly. If you don't like the prescription, don't complain about it. Get better. Get better. That's what the prescription is for. This is why I'm using that word prescription in there, is that this is what we need to do. Government should make us repent. Or we can kick at the goats, and we can fight it, and we can protest it. But... Our response should not be complaining as God's people. Our response as God's people should be repentance. Now, this is a chronic problem that they had. And the whole book of Judges is God sending them someone to save them every 40 years mm -hmm. and bring them back to him. And I think they were thinking, well, now if we get a king, we'll solve the whole problem because we'll have one person to look at. But it's almost like they built an idol yeah remember these people that samuel is dealing with um have rejected god mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an amazing thing yeah. and um samuel's work his lifelong work was trying to help these people bring godliness back um show them the power of the lord um but and he's 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 old at this point he's not he's probably of my age or your age you know <laughs> You know, he's not a, a spring chicken anymore. So he's worked his whole adult active life being a great judge for these people and helping them. And yet it still was not enough. Speaking of which, by the way, I know you like the book of Judges. Do you know who wrote the book of Judges? Um, wasn't John. Samuel. Yeah. And you well, find out later it. on in, sure. in Samuel, after there's a king, there's, I, I didn't look the verse up, but there is a verse where it says, after Samuel turned over the kingship, Samuel went and founded a school and he taught the prophets the history of the people of Israel, which, if you stop and think about it, is the book of Judges. And so um, both 1 Samuel and the book of Judges, the author, the person writing that down is, in fact, um, the prophet Samuel. And um, it's, it's helpful maybe sometime to go back and reread Judges with that in mind, because you'll find there's a lot of commentary in judges that um, we would read right by if we don't realize that this was like the syllabus the curriculum that samuel was using to teach um, what we would consider like a seminary level instruction for the um, israelite leadership that's what he was doing so after he was no longer the judge of israel he said he actually literally started a school in al rama and that's what he was teaching but we know he was teaching. And one of the, what was he teaching? Well, he wrote the book of Judges. He was probably teaching that. And there's a lot of insight into how people should be, the dangers of um, not repenting, 
the importance of following the Lord, all those themes you'll find in Judges. And, um, you know, you can imagine Samuel trying to teach that to the next generation. Um, so how do the people respond to this? If someone would like to uh, read verses 19 through 20. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there is there, there shall be a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. There you go. They wanted the physical material benefits of having a king. Okay. So is this now that top statement make a little more sense? Okay. I've got lots more stuff on. <laughs> I don't know if I could cover this material. Um, let's let's do a uh, simple exercise. Please don't want to be offended, but I want you to stop and think about a very famous a document in American history. It starts with the word "we." The people. Yeah. We have a constitution. Yeah, it's a U.S. Constitution. So just kind of in your own mind, we all sort of know the first sentence: "We the people." In order to form a more, more perfect, perfect union. union. More perfect union. What, yes. Yeah, you'll find in there are, are enunciated, are articulated the desires of the people founding the United States. They're all pretty positive statements. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Is that right? Well, yeah, that's part of it. But the, I just want to kind of let you stop and think about the preamble. What word does it start with? We. And what is it focused on? That we need oh. us. Our perfect union, us, our benefit, for our benefit, for, and so it's this um, focus, this very, very much focused on what we want as a people. And as Christians, we can look at it, and many of those things were positive, but what was the missing element? It didn't say, we the people in obedience to God, in order to, in order in order to, to be more. pleasing to God, in those, well, because the reason is, by the way, anyone have any idea why is it missing? Who were these people? Who were the founding fathers of the United States? They were deists. Most of them were mm -hmm. deists. Are you familiar with that word? Yes. You are. Because you actually know everything, John. So they, no, I don't. <laughs> a, a deist is not necessarily a Christian. A deist, I believe in God. That's about as much. They're not atheists. They're deists. Mm -hmm. But they don't view him as a personal God. And therefore, if he's not a personal God, there's what, this lack of accountability, lack of relationships, all those sort of things. And so many of our founding fathers, some of them were devout Christians, but many of them were actually deists. And you'll see that disconnect. I've got almost basically how many would describe the Israelites as deists? They believed in God. They just didn't want to do what he said. They would make good deists. So, um, again, I think probably you, Johnny, talked about nothing's really changed here. We are the same people we were you know, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, um, all these different things were happening. No, Israelites were not deists. This is, uh, this is an uh, artist. Okay. So just anyway, so kind of a cautionary note is why I bring that up, is that we sometimes get caught up in good ideas and good thoughts, and if they're not grounded in the Lord, where are we? <sighs> Well, there. We could be going off on this uh, wrong path. Yes. Okay. I think one of the other things that um, we have a misunderstanding about is um, this concept of good government. And there is such a thing as good government, but we have this concept of good government in and of itself as an objective. And so I want to have us take a look at, um, I'd like to go back to the New Testament to affirm this, I'd like to have Jesus's commentary on government. And that's found in Matthew 19, eight. It's, um, I'm, I'm trying not to take this out of context. Um, Jesus has um, been challenged on one of Moses's teachings. It was the teaching on divorce and remarriage. And the people go, why did Moses allow us to do this? It's an interesting question. 
His answer is even more interesting to me. So, um, Johnny, can you read Matthew 19, 8, please? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Keep going. No, that's good. So what was Jesus' diagnosis of why Moses provided the law to the people of Israel? Their hearts were hard. Hard hearts. What does that phrase mean in Jesus' mind? What is he talking about when he says you have a hard heart? Are you just a little confused? Are you slightly in error? What does that word mean, to have a hard heart? If I was to tell you, you have a hard heart, what am I saying to Michelle when I point to her and say that? Stubborn, yep. stiff-necked, I want my will, I don't care what anything else says. Yeah, but Jesus meant more than that. You'll find that on Nick at night, Nicodemus, when Nicodemus came to him, Jesus referenced this. What is that referring to? They, they were not ready to listen. It's, it's our condition, yeah, but it's worse than that. You're going in the wrong direction. Well, our relationship in a marriage is one of our relationship as the bride of Christ. So that's sacred. And to divorce is to, to separate, almost like separate from God. Right, right. So this was, this was a very important example that Jesus was using to illustrate a point is that the law was given because we have hard hard heart that is synonymous with spiritual what yeah. death and so what did jesus tell nicodemus he had to do to be born again because why does he need to be born again he's dead you are spiritually dead nicodemus you need to be spiritually reborn and so to be hard-hearted is to be spiritually dead. And so when Jesus said, Moses gave you the law because you are hard-hearted, he's saying, I gave you the law because you are spiritually dead. Which is this ungodliness that I'm referring to. See how this affirms that? So the law, government, is God's prescription for spiritually dead people. People who are not Listening and obeying the Lord are spiritually dead. And I, I should be clear, my, when I use the word death, I try and use it in the historic um, scriptural sense. Modern day teaching, death is non-existence. Mm -hmm. Scriptural teaching, death is non-function. You're not, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can have a phone. My phone is either working or it's dead. It's still a phone, right? But it either works or it's dead. This one happens to be a working phone. I normally do this with kids. I have a dead phone so that they can play with it. But it doesn't work. Yeah, it's dead, isn't it? It's still a phone. It just doesn't work. Same thing with us. Spiritually dead people have a spirit. It's just not working properly. So, so you yeah. think government is God's prescription for unloveliness. Mm -hmm. And it still will be. It's never complete. I mean, a prescription, is, you know, treats you for a while. And yes. then you're either healed or you succumb to whatever you want. Yeah, once you're well, you don't need the prescription. Anymore. Exactly. And then you get, well, I can handle this. I don't need the government anymore. I don't need that prescription God sent me. Right. You actually ever find that? You're going to make me jump ahead a little bit. That's fine. I don't mind jumping ahead. Um, so uh, if you want to read Romans 6.14, it will tell you how much law a um, Christian needs. A spiritual Christian needs how much law? Romans 6, 14. Just one. Okay. But what, what, what? For sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. Right. So how much law does a spiritual Christian need? Uh, none. 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 If you're healthy, you don't need the prescription anymore. Okay, because why do I need the law? I'm going to do whatever the Spirit tells me to do. I'm totally obedient to Jesus. How much written law do I need? How much governments do I need? I'll, I'll give you a counterexample of it because um, 
I love to do that sort of thing. I was working with Jim Byer many years ago on uh, church policies, and he made an interesting comment because uh, he's a circuit pastor and he sees a lot of different churches. He says one of the things he had observed is that churches, um, when they get really good at writing policies and procedures, which are forms of law, of government, they're about to close the doors. Isn't that interesting? They're about to, the church is dying. A sign to Jim Byer of a dying church was when they got very focused on writing down the laws and rules they wanted people to follow. They're spiritually dead. They're not being obedient to the spirit. They're not hearing God speak to them, either individually or as a, a congregation. And um, so there's a lot of truth to these things that I'm going to be sharing in here that are very applicable to us and comply to us and helps us see what God is up to. What is God's view of government? Remember, that's what this class is about, not what I would want government to be. This was really hard for me when I started researching this stuff because I'm going, but, but, but. You're starting to feel the butt, butt, butt yourself <laughs> what I'm talking about. Um, it's, it can be very humbling to suddenly realize that, you know, myself included, my first 50 years of political life, I was complaining about government. That was me. And looking to government to solve problems. And it can really distract you from what God is up to. And it goes like, um, there's a movie, um, called Return to Me, and there's one line in there where um, in this movie, she found out that she had a heart transplant, and the man that she's in love with, that's the heart of his ex-wife. And she's like, God, what were you thinking? That's a great question. We need to ask that question more often in our life in general, but certainly when we look at government. God, what are you trying to do with this government? Um, what our society, because it's any form, it could be a church, it could be at work, it could be a, a, a public government, but we we need to have this sense that he has a different pers- he has a different perspective and approach to this than we want. It's going to be completely different. It's like Jesus in Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount: to live, you must die; to you know, turn the other cheek. It's completely different from the world. He says blithely. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, it is. Okay. I'm just going back to my notes here. Okay. So um, let's see. We've covered the prescription. We've covered the functions of government. Oh, by the way, I, I did summarize all this um, because it's something that we don't like. This is just a, an observation. I don't have a strong verse for this, but it appears that the method or the way that God uses government to limit the evil of a people is that he has the government reduce their wealth. The people's wealth. Yes. And so he makes us less wealthy. He, he, he restricts us. And you know, I'm kind of thinking, why would God do that? Because everything on this list is I'm losing stuff. I'm losing my freedoms. I'm losing my wealth. The government is taking stuff from me. And it's like, why is the Lord doing this to these ungodly people? Well, God's purpose is not only our repentance, but it's also to limit the amount of evil we can do as a people. And so um, that's a, I don't have a, a, maybe there is a verse out there. I just don't know it. I don't have a strong verse that backs that up, but I have that as an interesting uh, kind of summary comment. Is God takes our stuff to limit the amount of evil we can do, but he certainly does take our stuff. That's very clear. The purpose, um, other than repenting, may also be just to limit how much evil we can do. And I think about, you know, um, very corrupt, evil societies. You know, you can pick the Nazis, you can pick communists, you can pick um, totalitarian regimes. There's a lot of destruction of wealth that's going on. Turkey, modern day Turkey right now. What's happening there? For those who pay attention to the news. Their economy's collapsing. They're being led by one of the most evil people in the world right now. Um, And... But one of the results of his policies is that the wealth of that country is being destroyed. So you can kind of see that, that um, there seems to be quite a bit of that intention that God has is an at work in Turkey. They'd be shocked probably to hear that. The problem, though, is that our heart goes out to the people that are left. I think about Haiti with Papa Doc and the Duvaliers, and just they looted that nation, which was already poor to begin with. And then they get earthquakes and typhoons and 
hurricanes. Right. And, this is but, not a call for us to go any, any, any. You know, you deserve what you're getting. I really appreciate you bringing the passion up, Sean. Yeah. Very good point. Because that is also God's heart. By the way, is this prescription for their evil? They're hoping to get them back to God. No. No, the prescription is, you know, that they might repent and return yes. to the Lord. That is the intent of the prescription. It is not punishment. It is a prescription. It is trying to make you well. Romans 13 seems to reinforce what you're saying. Um, 13, uh, actually, from verse 1 all the way to um, verse 7. Um, it's necessary to you uh, to be in subjection, not only because of the wrath of the authorities, but also because of your conscience. For this reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants devoted to governing. Pay everyone what is owed. Taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Right. And what you sense there on Paul is not doing the mistake of complaint of protest because you can hear the submission on that is that what if, what is that we as christians should lead the way at accepting the prescription okay that's not all we need to do but that yes. is a key element of it is and we'll i'll get this this there's a lot more to what i've got to cover this is just the intro first thing I stumbled into was this concept um, that made me stop and rethink. Maybe I really don't know what God's purposes for government are, because I would have never thought of these terms before. How are we doing for time, Sean? Oh, you've got 25, half an hour. All right. I think we can go to the next point then. Um, so these are rules that apply to a society or a group of people. So this is not about just individuals. This is more about groups of people. And so when I look at a group of people, a country, a church, an organization, whatever it might be, I had this question in my mind. How does it matter if you're godly or more god ungodly? Is there a spectrum of this prescription? Does it vary? from a bunch of really ungodly people versus, well, they're pretty good people. Well, we kind of see that. Um, you certainly saw the example that we read from Romans. If we we're all spiritual Christians, obedient to the Lord, how much government do we need? Zero. We're done with this prescription. If we're totally apostate, it could get really bad. And so we kind of have a sense, and there's a lot of verses, by the way, which I'm alluding to right now, that talk to this, that it's not a black and white sort of thing. You're either ungodly or godly. There seems to be this uh, continuum of going from being sort of good people to not so good people to really awful people to no one gets worse than you. And so there is this seems to be this sort of continuity and God's responses are probably different to that. Um, it's like a, there's a comic strip that I just read that uh, I thought it pointed out the human quite so well. A uh, little gal asked Santa, you know, uh, the first thing Santa says, well, you've been nice uh, all year? He says, and the gal thinks about it a minute and says, is there a middle between naughty and nice? <laughs> I, I said, boy, that really describes a human being. So I suspect that that is not God's criteria. Naughty or nice? Naughty, no, in between. Uh, you know, God, on a scale of one to ten, how am I? But that's where we are. Well, we, we ask that question. So it, on an individual basis, this is probably why what I'm about to share doesn't apply very well, because it's either a yes or no type of question. So either I'm on God's good list or I'm on his bad list. But for a society, how does God judge a society? What does he look for? And that's the thought I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer, and then we'll look at a bunch of Bible verses to back that up. Yeah. The godliness of a society is based on the number and quality of the believers. 
<laughs> the godliness of a society is solely based on the number and the quality of the believers. That's kind of like number two up here. Long time ago when I was doing Sunday school, every year the pastor would ask me how many students you have, how many da da da. And these were statistics that were devoted to the Sunday. And that used to bother me because I always thought if one turns back to God, that is important. And I didn't like numbers. I didn't like the numbers placed that you had to attain or to see where we were. It, it just bothered me. Mm -hmm. um, and you were right. It's not, it's about that. Okay, so we'll let's see if there's any truth to that. Um, someone read me Genesis 18.32. Okay, go ahead, Ronnie. Uh, then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? <laughs> like All right, we'll yeah. finish it though. What does oh, God say? Okay, okay. Oh, okay. He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. Okay, so he how many godly people does it take to save two small cities? Ten. At least. Ten. Mm -hmm. All right. The only there was only one godly person in there. His name was Abraham. No. Lot. Who's the godly person in Saul? Lot. 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 Lot was. Well, he was trying to save Lot. Right. Was Lot a godly man? Yes. He did a lot of bad things. I mean, as people yes, go, I mean, you know, he had like incest okay. with his daughters. He still, you know, he picked a better place. He ended up living in Sodom. He did all sorts of things that we could look at. Matter of fact, he has, I think, a pretty bad reputation in the Bible. So what I want you to do is I want you to find out what did the people of Sodom think about Lot? Genesis 19.9. What did the people of Sodom think about Lot? Not well. <laughs> Carolyn, can you read that? 99? Get out of our way, they replied. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. Right. So they were going to kill Lot if he had not been saved by the the, the angels are the ones who uh, save Lot. Does anyone know how did the angels save Lot? Blinded. They, they blinded. He blinded everybody. They blinded everybody. Here's Lot trying to protect the angels. They ended up having to protect him. Nice piece of story. But here's the key thing. As bad as Lot was, what did the people of Sodom think about Lot? They wanted their, they wanted their problem and be like them. He was yeah, a righteous did. prig. Get rid of this righteous guy. Some alien comes to live here, and now he wants to tell us what to do. What's wrong with this guy? He was <laughs> righteous in their eyes. He was a God follower. And how do we know that? Because what did they want to do to him? Kill they him. wanted to torture and kill him. So if you're ever wondering, Lord, am I righteous in the eyes of my neighbors? How many of you are being persecuted by your neighbors and they want to kill you uh -oh. because you're a Christian? That's a pretty high bar. <laughs> So before you start condemning Lot, he was good enough where the evil people wanted to kill him. That's an interesting thing. So there was one righteous person, at least in Sodom. It just wasn't enough to save the city. But he, in fact, was a righteous man. And I, I use that based on that criterion that he, he brought godliness to Sodom and they were on. That's a very, very key, important spiritual issue here. Because it answers the question, if there had been 10 lots, God would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah. He wouldn't have destroyed it. Why? Great question. Maybe you can come up with the answer. Okay. Um, 1 Kings 1918.
1st Kings 1918. The context here is that Elijah has just defeated the prophets of Baal on top of the mountain, call down the fire, and um, they kill all the priests of Baal, and the queen, Jezebel, puts a decree of death out for Elijah, and her king, Ahab, her husband, who had just seen all this happen, backs her up. And so this is Elijah before the Lord, fleeing for his life. Go ahead and read 1918. 18. Uh, 1918. 18. Yeah, I, <clears throat> yeah, I will leave 7,000 in Israel. All the knees that have not bowed to bow, and every mouth that has not kissed it. So there's 7,000 left in Israel. Because what Elijah had just said to the Lord is, Lord, I'm the only one. I, I give up on these people. And the Lord said, I have not. Mm -hmm. There are 7,000. So how many people does it take to save a nation? Nope. 7,000. 7,000. <laughs> I don't know about one. Jesus is the one. Jesus. But 7,000 was enough to save a nation. How can 7,000? And by the way, just to put this in context, the sin of the Israelites was not that they didn't worship God. is that they worshiped God and other gods. It's called syncretism. And so we'll do them all. You kind of cover all the bases. They were syncretists. How many were not syncretists? 7,000 had not worshipped other gods. That was the criterion that God is using. These are sold out, dedicated believers to the Lord. They're not doing lip service. They're not showing up on Sunday at church and then going to the Hindu temple on Tuesday. These are sold out people. They make a difference. They would pass the lot test. I thought he was just trying to encourage Elijah because he was so down and he's the only one left. But don't you feel like that at times? <laughs> You're... This is a very key message. I'm going to go ahead and tell you what, where we're going. It doesn't take many. Mm -hmm. This is the encouraging message that I want you to understand. But it does take others because it can't do it alone. It's not, but it's, it doesn't take a lot. It took 10 to save two cities. 7,000 would save a, a nation of millions of people. Okay, what's going on here? We'll get a clue. Matthew twenty-two fourteen. Jesus, this many oh, are invited, but few are chosen. Right. What does Jesus say about the size of the church? Many are there. There are many. No. Read the verse again. You got it backwards. For many are invited. Oh, invited. You are chosen. What does Jesus say about the church? Are we going to be a majority organization? No. I mean, in this, country, no. in this country. No. It's a matter of the few. Yes. But so. we don't know. He is chosen. That's really none of our business. Our business is to be the messenger and... No, I'm just telling you, that, but this is this issue. Do I have to become a majority to make a difference in my country? So. No, it says only a few. I'm trying to give this message to you that it, yes. the moral condition of society is not its average moral level. It's the number and quality of the There's believers. That's what makes the difference in a society. Don't you think that's why we are like we are today in this country? Because God is absent. Can be, it can be. Um, let's let's just touch on that. Um, there's three places that this concept is clearly articulated in the New Testament. Twice is by Jesus. Both are found in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. He's giving us a very deep spiritual principle here. You're really fast with the scripture here. <laughs> Someone want to read that, please? Matthew 5. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made slowly again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill 
cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And 16. Okay. Nope, that's it. So what is that characteristic that we find in those verses about these godly people, the spiritual people? What is that characteristic? He can't be hidden. Can't be hidden? What's the other one? What's that saltiness? That saltiness you have to have. You have to maintain your belief. You're right. scattered throughout. You're scattered throughout? What's saltiness? If you don't have your Flavor. salt, Flavor. Hmm? Flavor. <laughs> you can be detected. The hidden Christian is a Christian that has no impact on their society. And again, I'll take you back to the example of Lot. Was Lot a hidden believer? No, they hated him. They hated him for it. Now, not your neighbors don't have to hate you. That's just kind of the extreme case. This is a city about to be destroyed. But there is this detectability. There's the detectability. Um, and then the last verse that touches on that is Galatians 5, 9. I'm taking this slightly out of context, but I think it really captures the thought that we all have. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Right. Now, he was actually talking about sin in that case, but it also applies to the right. spiritual. It doesn't take a lot. This is... Key idea that that number can be very, very small as long as that they're very, very stirred. They're sold out. Um, Pew Research um, does a lot of different types of surveys. And one of the surveys they do every couple of years is what behaviors have to be in a Christian before you can tell them apart from a non-Christian? What characteristics have to be in place for a Christian to have so that you can tell the difference between them and society? And they look at things like um, incarceration rates and divorce rates and um, other types of negative social behavior, poverty, whatever, you know, I don't know, fraud, whatever it might be, but they've done a whole variety of these things. So I'm going to give you um, a list of stuff, and you can tell me if it makes a difference or not. They attend church every Sunday. No. Not enough? How about they read their Bible? Yeah. yeah. that make a difference? Yes, <laughs> You're kind of like, it's got to be right. Um, sure. They have a daily devotion time. Yes. Okay. Hey, I'm just kind of throwing these things out here. You probably think of some other things. What would, what would make a Christian stand out? So that they don't have this, on average, a group of Christians, they, they actually stand out and you can tell the difference between them. They believe that the Bible is God's word. Yes. That's necessary as it's sufficient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just believing that the Bible is God's word and that will make a difference in your society. Those under the heading of listen to him. You listen to God, okay. Uh, they were a theory that pictures is worth a thousand words. That's untrue. Listening is the secret. Okay. Um, I'll give you a Bible verse that might help you on this. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say? It's believing and doing, obeying. That's the obedience. And so there's the, the criterion R is that you believe it's God's word and you obey it. When I was a Jesus freak growing up in um, high school and college, we used to say we were sold out Christians. That was a common phrase when I was uh, in my youth group and stuff like that. That refers to the pearl of great price. The man found that um, pearl and he spent all the money that he had to buy that pearl. See, he was sold out. He didn't hold anything back. He went after that pearl. It's that sold outness. Are you a sold out Christian? We would ask each other, how are you doing on that? This concept of there's more than just a belief. There's an obedience that you would be like Lot. You would go, hey, this is my guest. Don't treat them that way. That's what Lot did. He says, these people are my guests. We don't do this to guests. And they said, who made you a judge in our city? They didn't like that. But he stood out. 
out of that. Again, I've really appreciated the show early on compassion, showing compassion to people. Boy, that's something that's missing in society. As we deteriorate as a country, we lose that compassion because Christians bring compassion. Yeah, we're all sinners. How can we help you? What can we do? My heart aches for you and the problems that you're facing. Those are the things of compassion. And so I'm trying to say, so it's, what does that spiritual status look like? It's the spiritually live Christian that hears God speak to them and obeys. Hear and obey. There is no other way. <laughs> we sing these children's Just songs, and there's so much truth in them. Yeah, five minutes. I just came from South Carolina for three weeks. And uh, there's a difference between California and South Carolina. Those people, they're a church, but every other corner seems like mm -hmm. when you're back there. But you notice the little things why they say Southern people are more accommodating, more friendly. You see them in these little actions on the road, primarily, where if you want to get in a line of cars, somebody will back up at you and let you in. That's just a little thing, but there's a lot of little things there. Uh, as for if you can't people, see it, it ain't there in general. There is more colored people working every place. Maybe, maybe the population is more like 40% than California. But in California, people have that idea. I'm away from that Midwest and that Bible setting group of area. I'm in California. I'm going to get away from all requirements. And religion is happens to be one they that on top of their list, and that is why your neighbors say, yeah, "I'm a Christian." What is that? Church. Me, that's the, the class. I don't want to hear it. They, they free. I told you that. I don't I'm want free. to come in at the end of it. Okay, okay. I appreciate. Yeah, they come in to listen. No, they have to listen. Have to hear something. And so, uh, to me. There is a difference to California and South Carolina. Oh. Mm -hmm. And they asked me where I was born, Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said, I still sound like a Southerner. You do? You got this a little bit. Yeah. Okay, I have just one last thought. Mm -hmm. We got time for that? Ooh. You have like three minutes. All right. Yeah. So this is found in three places in the Bible. Um, I'll just go ahead and read it to you. But it's Judges 17.6. Judges 21, 25, and it's repeated in Proverbs 21, 12. And it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Mm -hmm. And when I first read that, I said, that's nice. They're all doing their own thing. They're all doing the thing that's right. Today. And then something hideous would happen. Remember, this was written by Samuel. This is Samuel's commentary. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. They no longer remembered the judge and what the judge had told them to do, and they went off and did what was right in their own eyes. The, the one in uh, Proverbs even makes it more clear. This is what the ungodly do. And so I want to be clear is the opposite of godliness is not ungodliness. It's not doing what you think is evil. The opposite of ungodliness is doing what you think is right in your own eyes. Remember, the road yes. to hell is paved with what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a proverb for that. And that's how that's described. And so we see so many well-meaning people trying to do what they think is right. Just like the Israelites, when they wanted a king, they thought they were going to do something right. They thought it would be great. We're going to become a great nation. Isn't that what God wants for us? I'm going to think of all the good things I can do after I rob and rape and pillage my neighbors with that money, you know? Um, but so... Just kind of, again, I was focusing on the word of godliness. Godliness is not doing what is right in my eye. Godliness is doing what is right in God's eye. May that be a caution to us as we sometimes see a need. Oh, I sh we should do this. We should do that. And wait a minute, Lord. Was that me or is that what you want me to do? And wait patiently on the Lord to answer that question so that we don't end up going away from what we're taught in Scripture and what the Spirit would put on our heart and our conscience. So um, don't become hard-hearted, which is what the description of the Israelites was um, by Jesus. You want to have that soft heart, soft conscience, compassion, um, love. And so I, I have it later on in my notes, but I'll just give you a quick 
Um, um, litmus test, anger, envy, greed, witchcraft. I'm in Galatians, fruit of the spirits. No, fruit of the flesh. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness. So when you see those behaviors, those outcomes, okay, that was the spirit of God working through me. Oh, I'm angry. That's not from you, is it, Lord? You know, wanting to hurt someone or to get back or revenge or to manipulate, those are all things that are coming from my flesh. That is not, that's doing right in my eyes. That is not from the Lord. So that's the test that I personally use is I compare those two lists that Paul gives us. Fruits of the flesh versus fruits of the spirit um, to make sure that. No, the fruits um, are taken. They're not something you work for, but they something that is a result of your reaction. It can also be a, what I call a test. How do I test yes. myself? How am I doing, Lord? Good to see you. I hope you have enjoyed this study. Lord, bless you this week. Um, I've got about um, at least four or five more lessons of this type of material that uh, layer down into more and more of this. Um, yeah, there's more. I haven't covered. Or I just got the first two. I think I like six total. Prescription. You put a cross on the normal. Yes. So you're done? I'm not. Uh, okay, so we'll start it around 10 next week just because um, nothing else is happening. <laughs> so. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, thanks, Robert. Yes. Yeah,